Representative Ann Hugh from South Burlington. Um, I'm chair of the House Human Services Committee and I brought um, H57 to uh, the House floor. Um, and uh, H57 is a complement to the work that um, you did on Proposition 5. Um, what it does is it uh, puts in statute what has been um, the, the, the policy, the, you know, the, the non, um, Vermont has uh, had no legislation that either promotes nor restricts abortion in the statute. And um, uh, especially in the current climate, it, um, uh, there's confusion, controversy, and I would say in terms of the debate and concerns that came out around what codifying um, current, what is currently permissible without any statutory, um, what that indicated to me was the complete confusion and misunderstanding of what in fact um, um, was the freedom um, of making one's own medical decisions was in Vermont in terms of um, reproductive um, decisions. Um, this was a bill that um, puts in statute um, the right of an individual to um, choose to become pregnant or not, to choose to carry um, um, a child um, to term um, or to have an abortion, the, the um, right to, uh, to adoption, so all sort of aspects of um, reproductive freedom. Um, and I think that we heard a lot of the testimony that you did in, in that. Um, and it's, on some level, it's a very simple bill. It does not change at the, um, what in fact has been um, um, permitted um, in Vermont for over 40 years. Sounds like, a, that sounds very familiar to us. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I mean, that's, um, and, um, yeah. Good. Thank you. This that's very helpful. Any questions for Representative Pugh? Sure. Um, uh, so another way of saying it also is that it, it not only preserves what's happened for the last forty-six years, it will um, sort of keep keep that in place until the voters decide on Prop Five. Also, um, right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will let Legislative Council um, talk with you more about the interplay between. Um, Prop five and this, they are separate. Mm -hmm. They are they are complementary, and I would um, suggest that both are needed. Um, Prop five um, brings to the voters, um, in terms of um, do the voters of Vermont think um, believe that um, a strong value of reproductive um, freedom for individuals is such a fundamental right that it belongs in our constitution. Whether we pass Proposition 5 or not in six years will not, in fact, um, impact um, if we pass, if the, if the Senate chooses to pass um, H57. And um, then, okay, thank you. And then the other question I had was, I know that there were uh, a number of amendments that were offered on the floor of the House, mm -hmm. but uh, did the final version that you passed, um, the final it didn't have any amendments? The final version, um, our we walked into this not wanting to change what are the freedoms to make, what, what, what are the freedoms that the individual has in terms of reproductive choices. We were not trying to change what has, I, I will use the word policy, um, what has been you know, the policy or practice in Vermont, so, uh, but rather to maintain the current environment. Yes? Three years. How long it takes to be Three years. Oh, three years. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. I, I apologize. Thank you for that well, clarification. 22, and this is 19. <laughs> yeah. I, I get that. That's three. That, that is three. Uh, that's, <laughs> why, that's why I'm not on appropriations. <laughs> <laughs> um, Senator Weston. The numbers are not a strength of mine. <laughs> Senator McCormick. Yeah, I'd like to ask you to speak directly to, to uh, what has been for many people in the contention here. I'm hearing from constituents who are under the impression that this bill creates a presently non-existing right, creates a new right to late term abortions. Would you we speak have, to that? We have, um, for the past 46 years, 
had no um, prohibition on any medical decision and on any medical procedure. You will hear testimony on um, uh, the very tragic um, and uh, decisions, uh, and you will also hear um, testimony. You may hear testimony on um, what is happening in Vermont um, in terms of that procedure. Um, and I want to say it was the. Uh, it does not create any new right. It does not change what has been um, potentially. Um, um, happening in Vermont um, for the past 46 years in a, um, in a hospital. Uh, what I do want to just reinforce is some of this is a question of whose decision is this to make. And um, the House um, decided that this is a medical decision, this is a medical procedure that is not easy, that is horrible, that is tragic, that is scary and sad for everyone involved. It is not easy. And um, it belongs in the doctor's office. It belongs in the med excuse me, it belongs in the medical provider's office between the individual and their medical provider. Um, I can't be in their shoes. I uh, what was the vote in the house? Um, I, you're asking numbers 104, maybe? Something like that, okay. So it was a pretty strong vote. It was a very strong, it was a, um, there were, um, there were Democrats, I mean, there were Democrats, Republicans, progressives, and independents. Um, and, and out of, out of my committee, um, the vote was um, um, three, three opposed um, out of the 11. And when it came, ultimately, when it came to the floor for the final vote, when, when you think of the people on my committee, um, one person changed their vote and became a yes. Well, okay. Just one more. One more. Okay. Okay. Um, I would say to you that if Prop 5 becomes part of the Vermont Constitution, mm -hmm. that at that point, um, H57 would be moot. No. Because it's a constitutional right. That uh, so I think what I'd like to do is to have Brent answer this question. I think it's a, it really is a legal question. And right. I'll let, let Representative Pugh respond. There's no problem with that. I was going to say, Brent will go in and others will talk about both are important issues. Right. Um, what is in a constitution is the frame and how it is carried out in a state is what are laws. And one is going to happen in three or four years, and one will, will, protect, will um, protect current practice right now, in a time of confusion, in a time where the um, freedom of an individual, the right of an individual to make their own medical decision is being threatened across the country. It's not being threatened in Vermont, though. Well, no one here has introduced legislation. It'll be threatened everywhere with the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court does, but right. at the moment, right. the right. only way it would be threatened here is if we pass legislation that threatened it. Right. The legislature can always pass legislation. Yes, right. it can. That's what we do. Any other questions for Representative Pugh? Thank you. Thank you. And I apologize. I will not be able to um, stay to listen. And I know you'll do good. Next time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Bryn, this is our first opportunity to go through the bill, so we'll, um, we'll, we'll take some time to do that. And yeah, Bryn, do you mind being interrupted in the middle of going through? And so, so we want to be clear about what the sections mean, what the intent is. I think Representative Pugh is fairly clear. It's to reduce the confusion that we have and that's going on across the country with laws being signed into place and the possible changes uh, to Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court. And th this bill, as Representative Pugh has said, should uh, allow for Vermont to continue as it has in, over the past 40 some years. So we'll let you help us understand okay. that. All right, good morning. 
for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council, here to walk through H57 as it passed the House. Um, so Representative Pew did a nice job introducing the bill. Um, I would just reiterate what this committee already knows well from its testimony on Proposition 5, um, that in Vermont there are no state level legal restrictions on the right to get an abortion. And as you know, Vermont doesn't have a statute that creates an explicit right to have an abortion. Um, and as this committee has talked about at length, there's not any Vermont Supreme Court ruling that um, has uh, identified the jurisprudence on whether or not there is an independent right uh, to abortion within the Vermont Constitution, despite its um, decision in Beecham versus Leahy, which was the decision that invalidated uh, the statute that um, prohibited a provider from providing abortion. So I'll go into the bill, and I'm happy to be interrupted at any point to answer questions. So section one is the legislative intent section. So this establishes the intent of the bill, um, and, and it does a couple of things. First, it states explicitly that Vermont doesn't restrict the right to abortion, and that the intent is to safeguard the existing rights to access reproductive health services by ensuring that those rights are not denied, restricted, or infringed by a governmental entity. And then the second sentence, or the third sentence there, provides that Nothing about the act should be construed to undermine the supreme legislative power exercised by the General Assembly in accordance with the Constitution or the judicial power um, vested in Vermont's unified judicial system in accordance with the Constitution or to contravene 18 U.S.C. Section 1531, and that is the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act. So what this does is it states explicitly that nothing about the, the bill is intended to infringe those constitutional rights that are vested in the legislature to um, enact laws, draft bills and enact laws, and nothing is intended to interfere with the judiciary's right to interpret statutes of the Constitution. And also nothing about the bill should be construed to contradict what is federal law, which is a prohibition on the act of a partial birth abortion, which is defined in that federal act. So I'll go into section two. This creates a new um, chapter in Title 18 of chapter titled Reproductive Rights. The first subchapter sub is the Freedom of Choice Act. Section 9493 um, is the purpose and policy section. And what this does is it establishes rights as the policy of the state within the jurisdiction of the legislature. So this committee did a lot of conversation about the, the Constitution and how fundamental rights, individual liberties flow from the Constitution typically. That doesn't mean that the legislature has not enacted laws that establish rights um, as a matter of policy. You've done that in lots of places. Um, so the intent of this section is to establish these rights as statutory rights. Um, but as, as you know and as you've discussed, fundamental rights flow from the Constitution um, though that is the document that protects individual liberties, um, and so this is a little different. So the rights that are established in the purpose and policy section are first that the state of Vermont recognizes the fundamental right of every person to choose or refuse contraception or sterilization. And the second on page two is the fundamental right of every person who becomes pregnant to choose to carry a pregnancy to term, to give birth to a child, or to have an abortion. So the next. This, <coughs> this is language that is implied in um, the Prop 5, but it's not explicit. Yes. Yes. So this would be if Prop 5, if that were a constitutional amendment in a right in place, this would further elaborate on that, right? Yes, it would. Okay, thank you. So section 9494, this provides that interference with reproductive choice is prohibited. Um, and specifically, subsection A there prohibits a public entity from interfering with those fundamental rights that the previous section outlined. And subdivision B provides that law enforcement shall not prosecute a person for inducing their own abortion. Subchapter 2 provides the prohibitions relating to access to abortion. 
So we start out in 94, 96 with some definitions, defines healthcare provider. This is a broad definition that is found elsewhere in Title 18, it probably looks familiar to you. And it defines public entity as all three branches of state government, legislative, executive, or ju judicial, and any agency, department, office, or other subdivision of state government, including officers or employees within any of those branches of state government. And municipal government, including any officers, agencies, departments, subdivisions of municipal state government. So it's a uh, definition that includes all branches of state government, including municipal, municipal state government. <clears throat> so, so the next section, 94-97, this is um, sort of the heart of the bill. It provides that restricting access to abortion um, by a public entity is prohibited. So I'll just go through it line by line here. It provides that a public entity is defined um, in the previous section shall not deprive a consenting individual of the choice of terminating the individual's pregnancy, and it shall not interfere with or restrict in the regulation or provision of benefits, facilities, services, or information, the choice of a consenting individual to terminate their pregnancy. It also provides a public entity shall not prohibit a health care provider that, who is acting within the scope of their license from terminating or assisting in the termination of a patient's pregnancy or interfere with or restrict, you'll see that same language in the regulation or provision of benefits, facilities, services, or information, the choice of a healthcare provider acting, acting within the scope of their license from terminating or assisting in the termination of a patient's pregnancy. And the last section on page four, 94, 98, this is the enforcement provision. So this sets up a mechanism for enforcing uh, the provisions in the subchapter. And it provides that a person who's injured by a violation of the chapter has a private right of action um, in Vermont Superior Court for injunctive relief. And it also provides that any person who substantially prevails in that action um, may recover reasonable costs and attorney's fees. And then we've got the effective date on passage. It concludes our walkthrough. Okay. So since we're not the, we're not we don't get embedded. Well, we have been recently, but um, can you just talk a little bit about the private right of action within Superior Court for us, very sure. briefly? Sure. So that um, it provides that a person who <coughs> is injured by um, that subchapter. So if a person um, brings a claim that their right to access an abortion was interfered with or restricted in a way that um, would infringe on that statute, um, can bring an action in superior court, and the court can um, provide a legal remedy <clears throat> that's often sought in a civil action, which is um, essentially a court order for the defendant to stop um, doing something. That's what injunctive relief means. Okay. And then we put some parameters on what the person can recover, which is reasonable costs and, uh, and attorney's fees, only if that person substantially prevails in their action in court. Okay. Okay, Jenny. Yes, ma'am. We've heard that the right to late term abortions is limited by medical codes of ethics. Would this allow someone to sue if a doctor said, no, I'm sorry, there's no medical reason to terminate this? No, nope. no, because the, the only um, entity that this impacts are governmental entities. So it does not have um, an impact on any provider choices. Okay. Vermont doesn't have any public uh, hospitals or or healthcare facilities, so um, it would not impose any requirement on a provider to provide an abortion or a, or a medical facility to provide an abortion. Okay, so this is the laws, but it would not require a religious hospital if we no. had one? No, indeed. Okay. No, and there are also federal, um, there are, there are yeah. right, federal protections for, for um, 
provide specifically for providers and for medical facilities that have um, moral or religious. Um, so you're talking about abortion later in pregnancy. That well, know, that that that, yeah, that, that was just the one thing that seems to have. Yeah, that it was a trigger. I know it was a trigger. But they so we will we'll hear um, from healthcare providers, the current practice, and then how those things are handled. We did hear a little bit about that um, with Prop 5. Other questions for Grant? Um, the only question I had asked earlier, which is that if Prop 5 becomes the Constitution, mm -hmm. would it mean that that would be self or enforceable through the, the judiciary. Yes. So that the uh, legal the legal provisions in this bill would then be moot. So I don't know if I would describe them as moot because I think that the legislature's authority to craft legislation and set forth public policy stands regardless of what the Constitution says. So as, as this committee talked about um, under the 10th Amendment, the states retain um, what's called the police power or the authority to regulate for the general well-being of um, the public. And so I think that H57 falls within that authority. It provides that a public entity can't interfere with or restrict the right of a person to um, have an abortion. So um, whether or not that's rendered moot by the constitutional provision that the right to reproductive liberty is guaranteed in the Constitution, um, I don't think I would go that far. I do think that there is an interplay between them. So the, if there's a fundamental right established in the Constitution, um, I think that that's separate from, the, from what H57 does, which is provide that a governmental entity can't infringe on that right. But it can't anyway, because it's a constitutional right. Well, it can. They, you just have to go to court and have it said that it is a constitutional right. Laws are the way we work out what that constitutional amendment means mm -hmm. and the case law and what is free speech. I uh, describe it to my students as a, a, a ever painting with an ever smaller brush. Mm -hmm. Okay, but. Um, and also re remember the, the, the article in the proposal provides that there is. Um, there is an avenue for the state to regulate that right as long as it meets that um, compelling, compelling uh, the strict scrutiny interest. standard. If, there's, if the state has a compelling interest in regulation. A compelling state interest. Okay, I think that answers my question. Okay. That this, the statute, if this becomes law, then we have further defined what is or isn't a compelling state interest. Mm -hmm. You could look at it that way. Okay. Thanks. Questions? more questions would you mind doing this for us would you mind going through the bill one more time and talking about the what what's in the bill because I think as we gain some facility with and our understanding it will do two things one it'll gain we'll gain facility we'll gain understanding but also um, we'll be able maybe to ask more discreet questions so it would be very helpful for you to do this one more time sure thank you sure so section one is the legislative intent section. Again, that establishes um, the intent behind the bill and it makes some specific um, it, it makes some specific statements about what is not intended in the bill. And the first is to undermine the constitutional authority of the legislature to prepare bills and enact them into laws, or to revisit the policy decisions that were made in H57 and change them in the future. Nothing about the bill is intended to prohibit that or in any way cir circumscribe the power of the legislature to do what it does, which is to revisit the policy decisions of the past or create new policy. It also doesn't infringe on the judiciary's role, um, which is to interpret the laws or the Constitution. Um, and also nothing about the bill should be construed to um, contradict the Federal Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, which I think that we talked about a little bit in the context of Prop 5 which is a federal legislation that prohibits the specific, um, a specific act, which the act defines as partial birth abortion. That remains prohibited under age 57. 
Okay. Section two, this is the new chapter, reproductive rights chapter in Title 18, and it sets out those two um, rights that are established as the policy of the state. And the first is that Vermont recognizes the fundamental right of every individual to choose or refuse contraception or sterilization. And the state recognizes the fundamental right of every person who becomes pregnant um, to either carry that pregnancy to term or to have an abortion. So, and so, I'm not keep going. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <coughs> that sounds rather unlimited, particularly the part about abortion. Does that mean at any point during um, 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 the pregnancy? Well, it, you're right that the language does indicate that a person has the right to have an abortion without, um, without specific restrictions on that right. And that, I would, I would say, would reflect existing, um, the, exi the existing state of affairs in Vermont because there are no current uh, state-level legal restrictions on the right to have an abortion in Vermont, regardless of the stage of pregnancy. So it just means the legislature doesn't get to decide when met the medical community already has its own standards. Well, uh, in relationship to um, um, uh, Roe v. Wade that mm -hmm. is out there in right. in that, um, I'm just trying to understand what, how that, in that relationship, if the interplay between those, right. what that means. Right, so this gets us back to that Tenth Amendment issue. So you're right that Roe versus Wade provides that states can regulate um, the right to an abortion later on in the person's pregnancy. Specifically, um, there is a compelling the Roe found that there was a compelling interest in preserving the potential life um, once the fetus re reached the viability stage. Um, but just as a reminder, Vermont doesn't impose any restrictions. So Roe versus Wade and its progeny. Um, applies to the states to the extent that the states do regulate the right to an abortion. So what the Constitution does is it says here, here are the rights that people have and states if you want to regulate those rights you have to do so within the bounds of what's constitutional. So for states that regulate the right to abortion they have to look at those at Roe and their progeny to determine whether or not they're regulating in the bounds of the Constitution but because Vermont does not regulate the right um, it, that, that means that, uh, that the right exists in Vermont to have an abortion um, at any stage in the pregnancy. So, again, that, come, that we're returning to the Tenth Amendment police power um, of the states to regulate for the well-being of their citizenry. And if a state does not regulate the right to an abortion, um, it can choose to do so. And actually, I think it was the Casey Court even acknowledged that states can choose not to regulate abortion, even within the parameters of what the court deems as constitutional. Um, there's a, I can read you a quote from Casey. Subsequent to viability, the state in promoting its interest in the, potential, in the potentiality of human life may, if it chooses, regulate abortion, except where it is necessary to preserve the health of the, of the mother. So it is not outside the bounds of the Constitution for a state to choose not to regulate within their policy authority, their authority to make policy. <clears throat> and, and just to follow that up, so at what you had said earlier is that there is no jurisprudence in this state to that determines an, any regulation, nor do we have any state laws that currently regulate. Right, so there's not um, Vermont Supreme Court jurisprudence that finds that there's an independent right to an abortion. Um, as we discussed, the Beecham versus Leahy case really turned on the fact that the statute that prohibited a provider from providing an abortion um, by also not prohibiting a person from getting an abortion. Um, was essentially a validation of the right by the legislature. And the court said if the legislature is going to validate this right, it can't then prohibit the safe exercise of that right by criminalizing the act of providing an abortion. So that's sort of a different, um, that jurisprudence doesn't rely on the Constitution, doesn't find any independent right um, 
for a person to have an abortion. So this gets clearer and clearer. It, well, it does, but it's also it's not simple. Thank you, Senator. Do I? <clears throat> Go ahead. I sort of I, uh, summarized your answer before I left. I just want to make sure that I got it right. The amendment does put in the, makes reference to a compelling state interest. Right. And that's where, why the, the bill, if it becomes statute, is not redundant or moot. That it, it actually does sharpen the focus from the amendment. Yes, I, think, I would say it does. I it would agree with that. Statement. It speaks to the question of what is a compelling state interest. Well, I think that. I guess what I would say about the, the Prop 5 is that it provides that there is a fundamental right and the state can only interfere with that right if it has a compelling interest to do so and it regulates that right in, in a way that is narrowly crafted to achieve the interest of yeah. the state. So I see H57 as being narrow. Yes, but I, it also doesn't infringe on the, on the fundamental right that's established in Prop 5, so I'm not sure that it applies in that way. But what, what Prop 5 does do is it says, state, you can't interfere with this right unless you have a compelling reason to do so. And you do so in a way that's narrowly crafted to achieve that fundamental, or that uh, compelling interest. And what H57 does is it says, any governmental entity can't interfere with the right. But it doesn't provide that, um, that strict scrutiny standard. Again, that's a, that's for the court to determine. Because of the yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Senator Bessel, was your question answered? We'll get there. Okay. You, I mean, as for clarification, this is an opportunity to do that, and we will, we will hear from practitioners uh, today, uh, who are in practice today, who are working with and supporting or providing abortions for uh, women. Um, so we'll understand what the current practice is in the state. And this I, is... Uh, if, the, I might ahead. say that's where I'm, um, um, I'm not really clear. I'm not really clear what the current practice is. Good. I'm, okay, um, good. I'm clear that we don't have any, um, anything in statute and what that means. But I'm not sure if this really directly it it doesn't change what what we have is the law, but does this reflect what the practice is here? So I would I would I, obviously the providers I'm sure will be happy to answer that question. But I would say that because it um, imposes an obligation on a governmental entity and no one else, it doesn't impose any um, requirements on any provider or any. Uh, medical facility. So in that way, I don't think that it, it, it does interfere with what is current practice in any way. I didn't, that, that wasn't my point. Okay. My point was, does this reflect what the current practice is? I see, is? yes, okay. Which I think is a different place. Yeah. And, um, and although our hospitals are not government entities, um, they do all have charters. Yes, yep. And, so, and I'm not sure how that all relates and what it is I'm just trying to learn. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm happy to, to share what I know. I think that they may be the better, um, the better witnesses yeah, for that. Yeah, that's why I think I, I would wait until okay. they come and we'll probably have more questions. Right, well, then we'll circle back. I think that's, that's good. Thank you. Is that good clarification? Thank you. Okay, where were we? Okay, so I think we were at um, section 9494. Uh -huh. This is the section that provides that no governmental entity or any, no public entity shall interfere with those rights that were just established in section 9493. So a public entity can't um, deny or interfere with the fundamental right to choose or refuse contraception or sterilization or to choose to carry pregnancy to term, give birth to a child or to obtain an abortion. And then sub B provides that no law enforcement shall prosecute a person for inducing, performing, or attempting to induce or perform their own abortion. So 
subchapter two. So we've established the definitions for healthcare provider and public entity in 9496. And then moving on to 9497, <coughs> this provides that public entities shall not do these four things. They shall not deprive a consenting person of the choice to terminate their pregnancy. They shall not interfere with or restrict the choice of a person, a consenting person, to terminate that person's pregnancy. They shall not prohibit a healthcare provider who's acting within the scope of his or her license from um, terminating a pregnancy or assisting in the termination of a pregnancy, or interfere with or restrict the choice of a healthcare provider acting in the scope of their license from performing an, abor an abortion. So, I mean, so much of the bill is with respect to uh, the right to carry a pregnancy to term or not, or, or to have an abortion, but there are other rights uh, embedded in the bill as well. Yeah, so that those, that those specific, like reproductive freedom that's, in, that's included in Proposition 5, mm -hmm. that's really found in the sub, subchapter 1 of the bill, mm -hmm. um, in the purpose and policy section, and then the interference with reproductive choice. So I would say that subchapter one is sort of a broader provision that governmental entities can't interfere with um, a person's reproductive liberties in general. Um, and subchapter two really is specific, specific about um, public entities not interfering with the right to abortion. Okay. So I know that there have been instances where um, people have not had access to contraception or uh, other support services, reproductive support services. So this would guarantee that you would have some access. Right, it, yeah, it provides that you know a governmental entity can't interfere with that access. Okay. It's important. All right, questions? So um, are the questions that have been asked, I think, would, it would be very helpful as we go forward. If you can keep track, um, and I think each one of us will keep track of our own questions. There's no question about that. But um, if you can keep track of the questions that have been asked, and then from your perspective, from the legal perspective, if we can circle around back after we've heard testimony, and then we'll, we'll be able to um, understand the implications of, of the bill. That would be helpful. Absolutely. Anybody else? And I will be here, I will endeavor to be here when you hear testimony so I can uh, yes. also answer questions. Yeah. So I think our I think it will be on the agenda early next week. Um, and so we'll we'll be taking testimony at least a couple of days next week on this. We'll keep coming back to it. No other questions? You, I think you're all experts in the subject matter. So. <laughs> we are. I mean, Prop 5 was a good way to, to prepare ourselves for understanding this and ask some pretty, I think so, so the questions that have been asked are really terrific. So um, we'll, we'll just keep, we'll keep thinking. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank Thanks you. for your time. Great. So I, I did, I just, I threw, budget discussion on the agenda because I think we should keep coming back to it. We have the we have this, the information that has been brought to us by Stephanie um, with our human services spreadsheet. Yes. And I know you're all prepared to do this. <laughs> and uh, and we've also been hearing about things like reach up, um, obviously child care. Uh, and, I've, and I've gotten some emails from people with requests to keep certain things in the budget or otherwise. We are not the Appropriations Committee, so everybody needs to know that. And, and the second part of what you need to know is we are not probably going to be responsible for making the final decisions. Having said that, we have a significant responsibility to look at any of the, any of the bills that we have, but also at the budget 
to assure that the most vulnerable are covered and that we have um, adequate funding for all the um, programs that we have in place. So, with that in mind, um, I will open it up for people or I will begin a conversation. Well, I have a kind of, I have a little wish list anyway. Um, Good. Uh, well, the, I mean, I think the child care bill is, um, would be my top priority and, uh, and funding it to the extent that they, that we've asked for, which is just under eight million. But I, I think the, Part of it is that there, you know, there are a lot of moving parts, and we should keep them, try to keep it all together, and not just take, you know, not just give, a, you know, a portion of it, but really try to give them the eight million. Um, that would be my yeah, top so priority. How much more for a computer system? Well, yeah. you know, I think there are some questions that we're going to have to um, ask, and if we don't ask them, they will be asked down the hallway. Mm -hmm. So whether or not um, the computer IT is the first place to begin, I think is an important question. Uh, I also uh, raised the question about there's a million dollars in, in the child care bill for workforce uh, development. And we're talking about workforce development. And maybe there's some creative way to utilize that funding and other funding that wouldn't, um, you know, that would help others as well. So to think of that, I mean, this is all about child care. I know it's one of the governor's uh, projects that he's very interested in. I think we're all interested in it. The other, the other piece that I keep thinking about is what's going on with reach up. With good economic times, you see a decrease in caseload, but that doesn't change the complexity of some of the cases that are there. And I, uh, Senator Westman's been working on that. So, um, you go? No, I was just saying, we talk about resilience and stress in families, and we haven't upped that basic yeah. reach up yep. in 10 years. Yeah. We still, I mean, we, we threw some money at, you know, apparently the crisis in, the emergency rooms with mental health has slacked off a little, mm -hmm. um, but it's not that screaming headlines it was. But that's still an issue. We're still not paying competitive wages. Well, I you know I go back to I go back to Nina when she was here, and when she got on Reach Up, she still wasn't able to do the things to take care of her family, no. which she needed to do. $770 a month yeah. for a family of four. Right. That's it didn't, the it, rent in most places. That's, right. Yeah, yeah, not even. So, yeah. Just barely. Yeah, just barely. yeah. yeah. but the, the, we won't talk firm. about affordable housing yet, but I mean, that, <laughs> you're right. I'm That's okay. the rent in affordable housing. If you're looking at the base payment, it's 640 and um, if you look at the chart for childcare, where um, they've got reach up participants um, doing $75 a week, that's $300 offering your $640 a month. Who can live on $340? It's a vicious cycle. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can't get out. And I did an email, I guess a bunch of us did this morning from a lady whose mother's in a nursing home. John's that was going to go there next. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, she gets, I think it's $47 a month for personal needs, but 21 of that goes for television and stuff to the nursing home. That's an extra charge. Plus, if she gets her hair cut once a month, it's $16, which is a real deal. Um, but that leaves her with $10.77 for the rest of the month, or, you know, that, that's to buy a new nightgown, a new dress, toothpaste, yes. all of the, so the daughters are doing it, but there's people that have no family. I know, I know. When you talk about quality of life. So, yeah. well that also, 
Um, I would much rather, um, instead of us taking up um, the child care bill, if in our response to the Appropriations Committee, we laid out our priorities um, as we go down. I will tell you there are some huge holes. Um, I, they say it's inadvertently, but the House cut um, uh, foster care payments. I heard this. By um, something like $350,000 yeah, that you have to this. come up. Um, I gave you the rates, the yeah. base rate for, um, for someone with um, zero to five kid um, is $13 a day. And so they eat that well, <coughs> for breakfast. So they right. eat that. I, to so, so we've got that um, level three um, residential care homes, and yeah. we have around 130 of those. Um, the base Medicaid payment is thirty-seven dollars and twenty-five cents a day. That's for three meals. Right. And, and they, the, 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 that's why these businesses are going out of business. Uh, yes. And the more of the residential care homes that go out, it puts more pressure on um, our 30 some odd nursing homes mm -hmm. in the state in, um, to increase that $37.25 a day by $5. It's a $2 million item. So we need to be strategic about this in what we do, or I can tell you in appropriations, it will become very hard to um, put everything together and recognize what the priorities are of this committee. Well, um, I have talked at length with Senator Kitchell. And, I know you have. Yeah, and, and you, and you've done an amazing amount of work both on reach up and foster care, and it's been very helpful. And we have the whole issue of the relationship between case management for reach up. Yes. Um, and the parent child centers. And yes. The, mm -hmm. cut, the, the contract by $1.6 million. And then, and the question is, as, a, as we were talking before, if even with the reduction in caseload, you still have the complexity of caseload and the need for those wraparound services that families are getting in the parent-child center. So. And I remember last year when we were concerned about nursing homes closing uh -huh. and or being taken over, the agency saying part of the problem was they based rates assuming 80 percent occupancy we're doing so well with choices for care, they don't have 80% occupancy. Except now they've taken choices for care money right. and give it to SASH. Yes. Okay. Which is like robbing Peter to pay Paul. Paul. Yes. And you got it. If we get down to level threes, maybe they'll have 80% occupancy in the nursing homes. But we've been on a starvation diet mm -hmm. for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the economy is due to slump. So and then Again. and so then then the question becomes: Is childcare the silver bullet? I mean that is the question. It because is. if we're going to invest the eight million dollars in childcare, is that going to solve the problems that we're seeing in these other areas? I just I raise that as a question. For the committee. There's also cuts. There's cuts in the estate tax. Yeah. Cu oh. Cutting the revenue. Uh -huh. There is in, there's cuts in capital gains. Lost revenue. Is that in the new t in That's the tax in the bill? That's revenue bill. Yeah. It, is there any new uh, revenue? Mm, it, it, yes. There is new revenue that the house raised and spent. But we don't bank on that yet. Yeah. And next year is a is a downturn year. I mean, well, it's a level fund year. It's not. Yes. A, uh, yeah. uh, just first, of the, my annual uh, full disclosure disclaimer is that my wife is with uh, uh, Action Circles who deals with a lot of children's issues. Um, but I, I want to 
echo the, the comments about the uh, parent-child centers and reach out. Because I think it's important. Uh, it's not just a matter of administering the, uh, the, the pass-through of the money. It's that they do a wrap Not around. just the money, right. It's right. The people yeah. or, or whatever has gone on in their lives that they, that they need to reach out. That there are other issues besides yeah. money that need to be addressed. They are not from the government. <laughs> That's right. That's right. There are people who are intimidated by a government office who are not. They have the power to take away their children. They are terrified. Of well, yeah. yeah. I, I, I actually go at home. We're sitting. Joan and I are sitting here with coffee. We're talking about all of this because I can't help not. Your yeah. house is as exciting as mine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the conversation comes up. If you were, there are roughly 20 people doing um, case management at um, yep. in the parent child centers. We have 53 people in, um, in DCF that are doing the case management piece. Granted, the case managers in, um, in DCF have all of the cases that are over 60 months. So one could look at that and say it's probably the harder. And the caseload is down 37%, and the amount of people that re are requiring case management services is down about 50% because there's a portion that don't want case management. So as you look at all of that, and I, the pushback for me is if um, I have less work and I can't manage the service, would I rather give the work to those 20 people at the parent-child center, or would I rather um, reduce staffing in DCF? And what does that, what would that look like, and how would that, in, in that piece, um, do that? The, you know, um, CIS is, um, we, as we've heard in here, uh -huh. is desperate need of, yep. of money. There was two million dollars in the um, governor's budget to help in that area shore it up, and all of that money got cut in the house. So as they struggle to put together that whole budget, those are all things that are. But when I go home, Joan would say to me in the chair, "If I was a reach out participant, I'd rather go into the family center." Then go to a state agency. Because mm -hmm. you're getting down to, you're, you're not only dealing with the immediate problem, you're dealing with the underlying issues as well. But well, it's just more friendly. Yeah. Just. That's There's a also big a, office. A, a, claim, a claim is made to me, and I, I, I don't stand by because I don't know enough, but I've heard that, that it's, it may not be that, that um, the agency is overstaffed. That because people, where there are fewer people on reach up, but there are a lot of people who are being deferred, as in my understanding is, they're not being, their situations are not being managed at all. <coughs> but because they're deferred, they're just sort of. Well, but when you're talking about going from a caseload of 34 to 24, 24 to me seems like a pretty reasonable caseload. Yeah. That's, what it's, that's what it's reduced to within the agency. So what is wrong with that? It's also the, the caseload we're talking about in the parent-child center. What is wrong with that? Why is that not an appropriate caseload? And why do we not help manage that? <coughs> we're not going to stay stuck in good economic times. But, so, do, but, but my question is, are we better to put the money towards um, the rate for the reach-up participant yeah. than in caseload? Yeah. Yes. Answer your question. I heard that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the these other, are not easy decisions. No, I, this is a this is a preliminary conversation. We're going to have to dive down a little bit deeper. I am meeting with some folks um, over the weekend, so we'll try and get see who we maybe want to have come in and talk about this a little bit. Um, and then the question is. There are 21 positions being take, uh, lost through attrition. 
So I want to know where those positions are. Do you, do you guys have a sense of where those positions are? And when we were doing the child, when the two kids died in state custody, yeah. we had double the national average caseload. I, this is what I'm saying. We yeah, I'm trying do. to remember. I thought 24 was... That's what's going to now. Yeah. But the, it, it has been, I can remember just saying 34, 36, that's way too high. And especially if you think about some of the, the think about the complexity that we have. So, yeah. yeah and maybe sense. that's an explanation for our increased foster care. I don't know. I mean, you know, what, what, what's causing that? Okay. Well, I do think your uh, question, though, was a very good one about if we invest in some of these sort of bigger picture. I mean, I, certainly we need to, there are things we need to do immediately that are urgent. Like, I agree about the whole discussion about reach up and, and parent child centered case. <coughs> but I do think it's, very important for us to try to keep the big picture in mind and, and you know would helping families with some of these really big ticket items that they have to spend a lot of money on which I I think child care and housing yeah. uh, you know I'm, yeah. I'm always a big proponent of helping people stabilize their housing because that in the long run helps with a lot of other uh, you know substance use disorders mental health issues uh, you know the do kind of domino effect that we heard from Nina you yeah know, so um, yeah. Right. It's all connected. Yeah. yeah. It is, and each each one that we solve is like solving a, <clears throat> one adverse experience. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more. Okay. And we did. Uh, so, I've written down the list of things that we've identified that are important to us. Not in any order, but um, I'm going to add. The, I, I do think that we should pay attention to things like Choices for Care and SASH, and I don't know if you're mm -hmm. talking about that in appropriations. No, we're definitely going to have to. Yeah. yeah. You're gonna, and, uh, but you're definitely going to have to talk about that in, um, as I said, in relationship to, um, um, you know, residential three community care um, yeah. placements. Um, you know, one of the um, issues that just came up is they've sent, they, this week in Dale sent out a letter to everybody um, in the residential care settings. A lot of these are smaller places, you know. Right. They range from three to 150. There's a lot of stuff that's under 20 beds. And they just sent them a thing and said their nighttime staffing has uh, there has to be two people on staff in most of these places are one. And I had a woman call me yesterday and said, if you send me to two staffing people at night, I ha I'm going to have to close. And particularly with the population that is Medicaid, that's $37.25 a day. And as I said to you, if I increase that rate by $5, that's $2 million. For one place? Or no, for, for, all, the, for all the places? For, for, for $2 million. All yeah. That seems like an appropriate thing to do. Well, but, <laughs> but, I, but, but okay. I, I'm just, <laughs> just saying. I know, you know I If I'm okay. stealing from choices to care yeah. to, to do sash, to. It's... Where are you going to steal that from? Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. Rest care. We used to have community care homes. That's what these, these are. are. Yeah. Okay, when I worked at Project Independence, which was an adult, still is, an adult daycare, we had a whole bunch of these residential care homes, mm -hmm. mostly run by elderly widows. <laughs> the concern then was most of them were going to need the care and were, you know, that, that eventually these were going to close and Washington County said, well, if we take them over, we have to put in elevators and we have to... Um, do all of this stuff and we can't afford to do it. But they took in mostly single older people, fed them breakfast, put them on the bus to the adult day. We took them all day, 
sent them home nice and quiet, you know, tired. She fed them dinner, put them to bed. Some of them were run like the army. But it kept the people able to be independent and in their community. And, you know, most of them didn't need medical care. Some of them had some starting dementia. They needed yep. some supervision, but, um, you know, somebody needed to make sure you took your pills. But they were a whole system that was aging out at that point, and some bigger places have come in. But it's, it's the groundwork for folks who will be on Medicaid and in the nursing home in well, these places. And what they tell you is the acuity of um, what is happening in the 130 places in the state. They're, it's harder Sorry. and harder to serve. Yeah. And they, um, there's a certain um, segment of the population that are people that have some mental illness. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Developmentally delayed. We yep. have yep. bunches of those. Yeah. So yeah. we had. Um, it's a safety net. It is the safety net. Yeah, so the CFAP payments are, I agree, the CFAP payments are important. Mm -hmm. The question is, how, what is the, how high? Yeah. And what is, what is the scale that we look at? And so I know that uh, Riva gave us uh, information early in the session on another way to pay for it. So I have a, maybe we should have her back in to talk about it. We're also going to look at in here, uh, I've invited Graham Campbell in to talk about tax credits for mm -hmm. child care, which might offer a different possibility. I don't know. It just That's cuts be, revenue, be, which just yeah. exacerbates Richie's problem. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's all rearranging deck chairs at this point. Yeah. On the Titanic. I, yes, Steve would understand. Yes, ma'am. I'm just going to say this for myself in listening to it. Please. So the young woman that comes in with the three kids, um, I want her to have the best quality child care that I, we can afford. But her basic immediate problem was there's no placement. No, there's no placement. Yeah, there there was a, no placement. And, you, you know. In the big city. And, and so 51% of everybody that's out there can't find any child care at all, regardless of whether it's good child care or bad. And she lost her job because she couldn't get placement. And there's a balance within this between um, taking people that are already in the system that you're trying to move up and trying to get more people into the pipeline. And, you know, um, there are certain places in the state where they've got tech centers running um, programs where you get like 21 credits towards college to the, but moving more younger people towards doing child care. And my question for this committee and the committee down the hall will be, um, should we be pushing in that direction a little more? And um, I've pushed Riva and the Department of Labor to, um, to work on that issue. I might use as an example, um, the tech centers have pro programs for LNAs and home health agencies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, the starting people that are going into the home health agencies get that LNA certificate, and then they move on in that. Is that not a model that we might look at? Right. I mean, you that can wasn't get, part of you that. Can get, you didn't ask for that proposal, but right. there it is. Yeah. But you I'm, can I'm get trying to right. credit right. for right. chemistry yeah. in your high school with the right teachers. Why can't you get part of your college credits we require for child care in your high school, in your tech center? Yeah, I know. So when you come out, rather than say, well, I'm going to work for a year because I hate school. I've got a place to go. She's on education. education. Well, I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we we've been working on a, a, a committee bill to try to um, provide a, a a year or 
maybe two years of um, tuition at our and include our tech centers. We've been looking at tech centers and the and the uh, state colleges. Um, and yes, we are. We would be very open to, to well, that. We've been trying not, to, to work not, on. Why not talk with Rich about what or and Ann about what what might be a, mm -hmm. a little paragraph that would help encourage that. Mm -hmm. So um, make that happen. From yeah. what I understand, yeah. in um, at North Country in Newport, they are doing a program now that gives a certificate for somebody to go in to um, um, child care. And that, that's consistent so with the, the Vermont State that's, College that's program. That's the model, isn't it? That, and that and so huh? if we can expand that out, can we get more young people moving towards child care? I, I, I'm totally in favor of when we get them in, trying to give them scholarships, longer payment, right. and stuff. When, but right now, we're desperate to open places. Yeah. Well, I we have to do it all at the same time, right? Because they have to be able to know see the future as, as, as much as I can afford. Get paid yeah. Yeah, into, yeah. Into, yeah. Into, yeah. You, know. you, you don't want to go on with school anymore. I'm a senior. I've been here forever. I hate school. <coughs> and so you go out, you get a job at McDonald's or somewhere. And you say, well, and I've read, you know, you read the, the senior class and the paper. Well, I'm going to work for a year or two. We, you know, you work for a year or two, you never go, you know, you <coughs> end up meeting someone, you have a kid, you, you're working at McDonald's the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. If you could come out and rather than see your options be McDonald's or Burger King mm -hmm. or, you know, if you could come out with a job, and a job, a starter job, job placement, you can work, but you're going to work at, at a career, you know, that, that, that has the potential of being a career. Mm -hmm. And that's an awful lot better place to be in. Mm -hmm. well, Plus, we need you. Well, well, yeah. Well, it's yeah. kind of what we've done in home health with LNAs being yeah. trained at the tech centers and then they get in that world and then right. they move on. Yeah. Okay. But yes. not everyone likes to draw blood. <laughs> Some people like kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's okay. give them options. And not everyone likes to counsel people. So we need we need all those things. We yeah, need that we workforce. We're gonna, we this is not our workforce discussion, but it's getting there. Yeah. 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 Come, I mean we can do all the programs we want. But if we can't stay, <coughs> yeah, 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 we would yeah. be very like, education would be very open to have. Yeah. I'm giving you something nice. right now. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> We're planning on taking up next in January just to uh, just to warn you. This has got everything in it, so now you can take it and play with it. <laughs> <laughs> it well, it needs to be a bigger path yeah. than that. <laughs> we got more very wants small than that. Okay. There it is. That's chapter one. That's just, that's just child care. Okay. All right? That's all you need. That's all you need. You just tell them to start. Yeah. Right? And I might say about that computer system in child care, they don't need it this year. No. But it's a three million dollar item, and if I don't get on the track before stuff begins to dive next year, you're never going to see it. I'm never going to see it, and they can't change the rates. Yeah, and really and yeah. I think it's quite compelling the way they want to change the rates. Yeah, yeah. No, I think a lot of really about good things. Why help our low yeah. birth rates? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. this is this is going to be an on the the child care piece is uh, the whole bill is is nothing more than an appropriation, and it's a it's a great appropriation. No one is arguing about that, but it's how much should we be putting into this, given all of the other needs that we have. And I I I, I believe that we have we do have a responsibility in this committee to identify our policy priorities, and not simply to rubber stamp everything that we see. I know this is hard, and send it down the hall. It's not fair to, to the Appropriations Committee. But we do have some things that we feel very passionate about, and that includes child care. So we want to make sure that whatever we do, we're not, we're not <coughs> tossing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. 
That seems to be... Or the nursing home, or the rest care home, or the reach out. Or affordable housing. Yeah, but when you talked about economic development, this just isn't just low-income people. No, yeah, that's right. This is working people yeah. who can't afford to have children because they can't afford child care. Mm -hmm. And it, that, it's across economic lines. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's probably the best thing we can do to support families. Yeah. Yeah to support, and then if we can find a way so the kids yeah. don't get sent home every time yes, yes. they spike a fever because they're teething. Yeah. But it would also help attract new families, and we're always yeah. saying we want new people in the state. Yeah. That would I, be a big, I, big red flag of, yeah. look what we Remember have. Senator Fair was in here. She had a it wasn't just a dentist, it was like an oral surgeon. Right. You're not going to invite him in. Move if they here. And he said, I will move to Middlebury and either open this practice or join this practice. But my wife, maybe she was teaching at the college, but we have to have childcare. Yeah. And Claire could not find, and money wasn't the object. Right. Mm -hmm. She could not find the money yeah. at any price. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that, that is the number one the number one ask. So whether it's the remote worker program or whether it's the in trying to encourage a child psychiatrist to be in the state or whether it's the LNA who's trying to make a living and support her family, they all need child care. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. If I had to choose child care and family leave, I'd choose child care. I've been working on family leave for 11 years. Mm -hmm. But if you come to what families need first mm -hmm. and foremost, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like maternity leave. Is yeah. there a person that I That's already been being discussed you upstairs. I, you saw those yes, I, heard, I, I know. Can tell I know. You can, <laughs> I know. Oh, it's not dead. dead. Look. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> that was told to a reporter who said it was off the record. Uh oh. And then it doesn't. What was off the record? Oh, the candy tax. They were just looking at the candy tax as a filler. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. I know. Yeah. So, how do you define candy? Just, that's, the, that's the big problem. Well, that's the. The problem. Yeah. Our um, yogurt covered chocolate. I didn't see that. What about Reese's peanut butter? Yeah, that is. And then there was maple <laughs> sugar candy. Snickers. Snickers have peanuts. Peanuts are good for That's why I brought them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. Wait, could you please do this for me? Could you <coughs> please look at the budget information that we have? And uh, if you need more detail, uh, we can ask for that uh, from Stephanie Barrett and, and then look at what's in the budget for the things that you care about and that we all care about. Because we do need to set our priorities. This is obviously our first, this is our first discussion. But everything has to be on the table for us. In here, what are the but what are the programs that we have that really offer the safety net, support families, or keep people in a living situation that isn't is meet standards. That's it. Yeah, I mean, allow people to be families. Yes, yes, and I you know that 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 that's a big range that we've just talked mm -hmm. about. I just, if I'm going to live with myself, I have to say, I think, I think a low birth rate is a good thing and necessary. But once the kids are here, we got to take care of them. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you, Senator. Okay, and and, and I, I think the parent-child centers are a very good thing for the both. I don't think there's no, any doubt about people that. People should they, you know, not, not have to base the choice on yeah. whether or not to have children on the availability of child care. Uh, I think they should make the choice, but that should not be the deciding factor. Yeah. And I, thanks to, is it Building Bright Futures or whoever keeps sending me these notes uh, to have my constituents talk to me. I've had people say, it's been so terrible. 
finding childcare that we can't have another child even though we'd like to. That's not a reason to make that decision. Not good. It is not. Not good. That's, just tie that up with, you know, interfering with decisions we talked about in the last bill. Yes. It's all tied together. It, it is all tied together. <clears throat> okay. So we have been looking at H249, but we never heard from the House reporter. And so I've invited Mary Beth Redman in to talk with us. And is Anthea going to come in too? I think Anthea. she should be. All right. Why, why don't we? Um... I'm still trying to find out where they raised the money. Where they cut taxes? We'll, we'll just hold. Where the money's going? This is the way to clear the room out. <laughs> Wow, happy to help. Don't take it personal. Happy to help. Oh, look. How exciting. It's the best. Uh, Hi there. Welcome to the first floor. We hope Thank you. Oh, you're here, you're feeling <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. 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 Peter gave it to me, but I was, yeah. I've been trying to come in and talk to you, but she had the little okay. sign on your door. Do it later. Okay. I wasn't even in there. I was in transportation. Oh, you're in No Sorry. worries. Okay. Really? So, which bill is this? This is Thank you for being here. This is great. Thank uh, you for having me. I'm used to seeing you up on the third floor. No. We had, so today we've had Representative Pugh here, and now we have you. Yes. Well, I went, to, I went to the second floor this morning. Oh, you did? Okay. For a meeting. <laughs> thank you for gracing us. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am Mary Beth Redmond, um, representing Essex Town. I also serve on the House Human Services Committee. Um, I want to talk to you about H249, which would provide additional reach-up program supports to Vermonters around the state who receive a car from the Vermont Department of Children and Families. And I, um, I won't speak to how it's how it would be paid for because I understand that's kind of a shifting shifting sand right now. Um, but I want to speak to this from a policy standpoint, um, and our committee is very much in favor of this additional support. Um, so it would be an appropriation of monies or a tax exemption, however you decide, um, for the waiving of the purchase and use tax on each motor vehicle as well as the registration fee for the first year of car ownership. A lack of transportation is one of the biggest obstacles that impoverished Vermonters face when trying to get and maintain employment, as well as to take care of their family's doctor appointments, school, and personal needs. The transportation barrier is exacerbated for many reach-up participants, as two-thirds of them reside in rural communities beyond the bounds of public transportation hubs. Those without reliable transportation are limited significantly in terms of the kinds of employment they can pursue. To address this situation, each year DCF purchases 60 cars from the New England-based nonprofit organization Good News Garage for reach-up eligible families in every county of the state of Vermont. Each vehicle costs DCF $6,000 which comes from funding already built into the department's base budget. The cars are repaired, inspected, matched to the size and needs of the receiving family, and come with a one-year warranty. In fact, one of our members from Winooski, Hal Colston, founded Good News Garage mm -hmm. in 1994 with the mission of providing affordable and reliable transportation for low-income individuals and families. And in 2016, Good News Garage presented its 5,000th vehicle to a family in need. Car ownership is one of the greatest predictors of economic mobility. Recipients of donated cars throughout this program earn higher incomes too, $200 more per month on average. They are also more likely to enter the workforce, maintain jobs, return to school, or pursue additional training. 90% of those who have received a vehicle via Good News Garage reported increased hope for the future of their families. One mother described the pride she felt as she was able to pick up her daughter from school and experience her daughter's joyful reaction 
is this really ours? Mm -hmm. Providing additional supports to cover the purchase and use tax and the first year's registration fee per car equals a program support of $434 per reach up participant. 60 recipients per year would receive, would require a total appropriation or exemption of $26,040. $26, the savings of $434 per family would free up income to purchase gas and oil changes to save for car maintenance and to provide for other family needs. We contacted the commissioner of the Department of Motor Vehicles who fully supports this legislation. In fact, the idea was hatched due to the collaborative work of representatives from DCF and DMV. The effective date of this bill would be upon its passage, and our Committee in Human Services heard testimony from the sponsor of the bill, of the member from Winooski, Legislative Council in the Office of Legislative Council, Reach Up Director of the Department of Children and Families, Senior Advisor to the Commissioner of the Department of Children and Families, and the Commissioner of the Department of Motor Vehicles. And the bill passed out of our Human Services Committee by a vote of 11 0 0. And your Committee on Human Services respectfully requests your support of this bill. Wow, good floor report. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. That's, actually, that was really nice. That, that put this into context for us. Mm -hmm. Have any questions for Mary Beth? No. Yes. yes. Um, so I have heard, um, you know, through my other job actually, that uh, f quite frequently um, a car can actually be, uh, you know, a bit of a burden to, um, to lower income people uh, because there are so many other expenses uh, related to it. So, so this would cover registration and tax, but then there's gasoline and there's maintenance and there's insurance on the car and that sort of thing. Um, I'm uh, just wondering what your discussion was in, in committee and about, you know, all that other stuff. Does it still work out being, you know, is the cost-benefit analysis still sure, actually more sure. benefit than sure. burden? Well, yeah. one thing we were assured yeah, by um, DCF is that the vehicle, they buy the cars for $6,000, but they are given cars that are, um, in you know, market cost much more valuable than that. Mm -hmm. So the cars are, are in, you know, they're in good shape. They're not like cars that are really, you know, just barely kind of hanging together. The other thing is Good News Garage provides a year warranty. So there's a full year of warranty. If there's any breakdown or any difficulty, they can return the car and it'll be taken care of. Um, we did not, basically DCF um, recounted to us stories of people who um, who really want the car and, and for them, you know, having, the big challenge for them is putting the money up front for all of these expenses related to the car so that if that is waived, then they have the ability to kind of like plan for the gas, plan for the insurance, all of that. Um, so we did not receive any testimony of concerns about that, that there were greater costs on the other end. Um, the bigger issue were, um, people wanting vehicles because many of them, and the other thing is we looked at where these vehicles get placed around the state. Like where are they, and they literally, DCF does a good job of um, having them placed really statewide in every county of the state um, based on where the needs are. So um, a lot of the people receiving these cars are in rural areas and this is a huge, drawback for them finding employment outside of their little downtown area. So we didn't hear really any kind of pushback that this is, you know, but I, I appreciate that you have. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And we'll take testimony right from Well, we'll, that's, well we've already taken some, we'll get a little okay. bit more, but I, yeah. I don't think we need a whole lot more. We need the DMV and we need the DCF. Mm -hmm. That's about it. You said six thousand dollars. Yes. Okay. Who gets paid that? Who, who is that paid to? Good News Garage. Yeah, it gets paid to Good News Garage. DCF has a, an appropriation in its budget for sixty cars per year yeah. at six thousand dollars. So they pay it to Good News Garage. Because okay, I've donated two cars. Mm -hmm. 
they were not six thousand dollar cars by the time I got here. Yes. So what, <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. And what Good News Garage, the majority of the cars they receive are um, they sell them for parts and they don't oh, get passed on. Right. But there are cars that get donated to them that are in really good shape and they can then turn around and resell to DCF. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of them don't get. They advise me to take about a five hundred dollar write off. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. There's that is actually the vast majority of cars they receive yeah. that happens. Yeah. Right. So. We have a list of people that you heard from, and we'll probably pick up a couple more, but sure. Uh, sure. when you talked with uh, DCF about the funding of this, and they said it would come from uh, attrition, vacancy savings, yeah. Yeah. And did this bill go to appropriation, uh, ways and means? So here's what happened. Or appropriations in your. Here's what happened. We originally had talked about it being um, a, a waiving fee, you know, a tax exemption. Uh -huh. And um, so that's how it had been proposed when um, the idea was originally hatched. And then when we took it to ways and means, they didn't really like that approach. They had made the point that. Um, they didn't want to start a um, precedent, um, which was interesting because they have other exemptions. Like there's one for veterans, I believe, on, on mm -hmm. automobiles or registration mm -hmm. for automobiles. Um, so then Ways and Means sent it to appropriations and asked them to create an appropriation that would be in DCF, you know, to cover this cost. And I don't think that, I think DCF doesn't feel comfortable having it set up that way. So then kind of things started to change, but um, that was kind of beyond our, our involvement. Did um, House Transportation take a look at the bill? Yes, they did. They took a look at the bill and they approved it unanimously. Yes, it did go through. In trans what context did they look at the bill? I would have to ask them, but I believe they looked at it. it at that time when it went through their committee, it was in its original form. So they would have looked at it under the guise of the exemption. So did they actually have possession of the bill? Yes. Okay. Yes, they did. did. My more specific question is there's VY money to move people into uh, hybrids in electric vehicles and uh, and there's a fairly significant pot of money there. And did they um, ask the questions, do you know, around whether or not some of that money might be able to uh, go in to help um, um, in this area? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I think that's something. I, my sense is no, because it moved out of there very quickly. Okay. Um, they just kind of gave there, but that would be a good thing to inquire about. We will. I'd That's like good. to ask Thanks. and see if at any of that VY money might be eligible right. to. Right. I mean, VW, you're talking about. Yeah, the about. VW. I, I, yeah. Sorry, Thank you. I'm like, because I was, I was going to no, wait a no, minute. No, I, what am I, I missing? I, I, wait, I, 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 energy my, I was thinking fun. Vermont. So no, no, no. It's, uh, it, okay. it's the Volkswagen. Yeah, the Volkswagen. Yeah, so so sorry. That's a great, great question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. What do you, I don't sure I understand. What do you want? <coughs> it's really for public. What, well, what is it you want to Yes, but it, it is yeah. to move but towards we will. We will. more we will. Uh, we electric will. vehicles. We will. And See I what you heard? The other thing I'm happy to share, sure. if you want me to send it to Maya, is I'm happy to share with you the listing of where the cars in the last year have gone around the state. If you'd be <laughs> interested in seeing geographically yeah. where they, I can send DCF that. DCF has that? DCF sent that to us, yes. Okay, we'll get <coughs> we'll, we'll have them in, and, but Great. send it to Maya, and then we'll... Perfect. Have them come in. Great. What are you suggesting? Volkswagen um, settlement. Settlement. Nineteen million dollars. Um, Nineteen million dollars. The question is, um, is would some of the functions that are being um, you're looking at with providing vehicles to this, would there be any way to make some of that money eligible for this? So, uh, as opposed to encouraging. No, 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 no. Okay, we'll we'll take this conversation up, but first questions for Mary Beth. Good question. 
Mary Beth, anything else for Mary Beth? Going once, twice, and sold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate Greatly it. appreciate it. Sounds good. I will now send that information to Now we can dive into the VW. I was looking for a clarification <laughs> of a question to Mary Beth. Oh, uh, OK. Well, but so with the VW question, I don't think they took it up in the house. They didn't look at that. I just want to ask the question to make sure it's not. Yeah. So a lot could, of this is buses and stuff, but not total. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'll talk with the chair of transportation, unless you want to do this. I was thinking about going over to joint fiscal and, and seeing if Neil could tell me what. What the VW uh, fund is now What eligible. the definition and what the eligibility are. Well, so what is it you're looking to do? By, um, but if somebody can get a hybrid or a electric vehicle um, through Good News Garage, um, could we pay for it? You're not looking to divert money from the electric vehicle incentives to No, I want to see if this we could fit something into this. Are, are you suggesting that the money would be used from the fund to pay for the vehicle as well as the I don't uh, know. Purchase and use? I, I'd like to, oh, I'd I'd like ask to that find question. out. Yeah, I would ask that question. Okay. Are you going to ask that question? I'm going to go over and ask the question, All yes. All right, that's good. I thought I'd bring it up here before I did. Good. Yeah, do that, because then we'll um, bring your response in. If we need testimony on that, that'd be great. We're almost done. Okay. We're done. So we can go. Okay. But I do want to, 249. 249, we do want to take up and finish. I think it's a really um, a good yes. bill, but it's the funding piece that we yes. need to find out about. Yes. Oh. You don't have to, but you guys need to find yourself. Let's take five minutes to do that when, when he finishes. Okay. We have appointments we can do. Oh, good. Okay. I have some. Yeah. Well, so I have a minute that we, we need to talk about Monica. Right. Monica Hutt. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, she gave me her bio, so I can. I have one. I'm going to call her next week. I'll to her. But I think if we can get some of these upstairs, then we won't. We won't it won't be just piling up. Yeah. 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 It's nice. Next week we'll have Al Gobe and Mark Levine in, so that. How about Kim Shatz? Ken Shatz, he'll be coming in. We've had a, very, a difficult time scheduling, but we're working on it. Okay. And he will be here at some point. Okay. okay. So, Senator Ingram, you have somebody? Well, uh, Monica Mon Hutt? Yeah. Is there, is there discussion? Does someone want to make a motion on Monica Hutt? I move that we confirm her. Okay. The motion's been made to confirm Monica Huff. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Monica, Monica Hutt. It's oh, okay. Keep talking. You're fine. We're, yeah. we're, 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 we're very, we're, we're doing, do you have someone? I think you've seen the sheet for Corey Gustafson. No. Yeah, his resume was um, oh, went yeah. around yeah. the table. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, All right. Um, you want me to go to the you? office? Please. We're good. Does someone want to make a motion on Corey Gustafson? So, no. So moved. I move that we confirm Corey Guftison. Okay. Good. Discussion? It's good. All those in favor of uh, confirming Corey Gustafson as Commissioner of DIVA? Aye. Say, aye. aye. Opposed? Okay. Now the others that are... I have someone. I have two from... Okay, you want to do I your two and then I'll do my one? I have one. Okay. But I didn't bring the paperwork down. But I'm sure Maya has a copy. Um, so the first one I have done, Hutchins, uh -huh. which was for the Children and Family Council for the prevention um, programs. Mm -hmm. um, said he wanted to do it. Um, his family was uh, originally from Wells River. He grew up in Brownsboro. Um, 
uh, worked for the University of Virginia, the uh, Darden School, um, you know. And does she want to do her this? And this is just, um, 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 would like to be on the council, um, now let's endorse it, blah, blah, blah. Do you do you recommend that we yes. approve her? Okay. Is there a motion? So moved. Discussion? All those in favor of Ms. Hudgens? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, good. So that one goes upstairs. You have the you have the form, right? That you can take upstairs? This um, looks like that. I do. I gave you the letters. I, they're someplace. Okay. And then, <laughs> then, do you have the next one? And then, um, Maya, Leanne. never let us have the only copy. I just did, did, Was the only that the only copy? copy? Yeah. Oh, shh. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Senator. I, mean, I gave sorry. mine to Faith. <laughs> Knowing my ability not to lose things. Go ahead for your next one. I still have all mine. Great. <laughs> mine are in the green folder finance. I have mine. Well. Senator, well, do you have another one? Um, yes. No. I do. I do. I have another one. Um, Judy Rosenstrike, who is oh, yes. from my district. Um, she oh, is a retired Department of Mental Health Senior Policy Advisor. She has done a great deal of work on, um, front with DMH and in coordination with the uh, Green Mountain Care Board developing CON submissions. Um, she was a social welfare policy analyst for DCF. Um, what she know? She has served on um, Criminal Code Revision Commission and various uh, administration of justice successful aging, state employees, system for board of trustees, Carnegie Corporation of New York, Vescu, Friends of the Vermont State House. She was in the House of Representatives from Waterbury. Now she is um, in Chittenden County. And she's been nominated to serve on the Board of Medical Practice, which um, has a, a goes from 2019 to December 2023. And I've talked with her on the phone. I think she would make a good, she's a very analytic yes. and um, would be very good. And she carpooled to graduate school with me. She did? Really? Oh. It was one year when she lived in Waterbury. Wow. Oh, how about that? All right. So this is a new, she'd be a new member? She would be a new member, and she's very excited about being on the board, good. medical practice board. Okay. So, so I'm going to move that we uh, confirm. Judy okay. Rosen's right. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So I have what? I'll take that upstairs. Oh, you have one? Yes. I have one. Okay. Um, Amy Davenport to the. What did you have? Commission and Children and Families. Council. Co for, yeah. Children yeah. and Family Council for Prevention. For That's prevention. yeah. Um, most of us, I think, know Amy. I've known Amy for years. She read law, yeah. uh, practiced law in Montpelier, was appointed a judge. Did you talk to her? But I caught her in the hall and talked to her in person. Um, was a judge uh, named by Madeline Cunin, became the chief administrative judge, um, has retired, has been on the council for four years, has done nothing to embarrass the governor, and would like to continue. <laughs> oh, can I ask a question? Sure. I saw her on the street. What's wrong with her arm? I think she, she said she fell. Oh, did she fall? Were you there yesterday to see the minister? Oh, yeah, that was cool, that thingy. Oh, oh, yeah, I Tom, Tom Hardy. Hardy. Tom yeah. Hardy. He gave me his he phone because the I missed it. He's was a he friend of mine. John Donahue. It looked like yeah. a peg leg. Yeah, it's it's this thing. So it is attached to his knee, and when he's sitting, it's it's straight out. But when he stands up, he it tucks his lower leg underneath that. it, and he stands on the on the peg part. Okay. Yeah, it does look yeah. like a peg leg. But I saw him. But he said it made it, you know, he doesn't have to have crutches. And he's got like 24 that he's got, plates. He's got three plates and 24 and, screws yeah. in his ankle. Mm -hmm. How did he do it? He fell. fell on the ice. Yeah, yeah I know. Don't fall on the ice. I know, don't do that. That's a bad no, thing. my son fell on the ice. He's just got the plate and the screws. 
and it hurts every time the weather changes. Uh -oh. He's now in pain management in Montreal. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. My, my son can predict the weather from a yeah. ski injury. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He says, and it gets really So did you get really the right Amy now. Davenport? Have yes, she did. Now we have no, we have not. That's did we have a motion? motion. That's a motion. 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 Okay. okay. Discussion? Further discussion of calling on the ice. <laughs> okay. Amy Don't Davenport. do it. Davenport. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I don't think she's underlined either. So none of these that we've done today, except yeah, for Monica. Monica, uh, yeah. uh, and I will find. I will and find Corey. my. And Corey. Corey. Oh, thank you. Yes. So Corey and Monica are underlined. That's right. I, I've got uh, Kevin Mullen, who we heard from, but I don't have his uh, resume. Yeah. So I'm not in a position to present on the floor yet. Theater and just get oh, us. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll hold hold up. We have a single page for. <coughs> Have we have the letter. That's all I have. Okay, so, so I'm going to ask him to send me. His good, that's what I did. I actually yeah. had planned on doing um, nominations this weekend. Yeah, I'm going to so. do that. I promise. This okay. Weekend. All right. So, so we'll, we'll all hold okay. off on Kevin. I'll try. Yes, you and my we will we'll work this out. Alpha Bay, Ken Chats. Oh, and I'm um, supposed to be Dr. 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 Levine and next oh, week. Uh-oh. Ken Chats probably not until the week after. Okay, but we need to get. But he'll, he'll 